Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is Gunther. I'm a grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon. And one day at a time, I've been working my program since April 4th, 1987. Now, that reminds me of a story I heard from a friend who said she was at her home group sitting next to a newcomer. After the meeting, the newcomer turned to her and asked, How long have you been coming to this meeting, honey? And she said, Oh, 23 years. The woman looked at her and said, Well, honey, don't you get it? And she looked back and said, Well, no but I leak a little. <laughs> and I think that's what I am. I'm like an old tire. I leak a little. And I need to uh, go back to my meetings on a regular basis just to get filled up again with the recovery that Al-Anon has provided me. I want to thank, first of all, the committee for asking me to be here, Don and everyone. I want to thank Tim for uh, being so uh, grateful and picking me up at the airport. Vic, for riding along with us, keeping us entertained, and for all of you to make me feel so at home in the 36 hours I've been here. It's uh, just amazing to me to be here and to see so many faces, but also to see so many men who are in Al-Anon. I shared last night that I don't think we have this many male Al-Anon members in the entire state of Oregon, let alone in one room at one time. Now, I'm also very grateful to be back in Texas. I've been lucky in Texas, I have to admit. In 1981, I was rolling west out of San Antonio in a stripped-down Datsun 260Z. I was told this morning that the state troopers don't even notice you unless you go over 80. And so I was certainly going faster than that. And this ranger pulled me over. He didn't come up to the window. He walked around the car once. Then he came up to the window didn't ask to see my driver's license. He just said, now that you know how fast it goes, can you please slow down? <laughs> and let me go. So, uh, how many of you can share a story like that? <laughs> I uh, have been very lucky and fortunate in my life. As was mentioned, I was born left-handed, which we all know is special. I... Uh, I graduated from high school in the world-famous Rose Bowl. It was an intimate affair with three high schools and about 10,000 people. And I was born on the 4th of July. Now, in this country, that's a pretty big deal. There's national holidays, often parades, fireworks, and it had nothing to do with me, thanks to my parents. They never let me think for a minute it had anything to do with me. But it is a nice day to have a birthday because I always get it off. And there's always people in good moods on my birthday. So it's a gift I get every year. But I all, all never did. Let me start again there. I did not always feel so fortunate. I was raised in a family of three kids. I was not the oldest boy. I was not the youngest girl. And at some point in my youth, my parents let me know that they really wanted two kids, a boy and a girl. And when they had two boys... They had a third kid and had a girl, so they gave up after that. Now, I often think that I have no business being in Al-Anon because I did not grow up in an alcoholic home. There was never abuse of alcohol. There was never any abuse at all. My family, my parents especially, were those social drinkers, the famous cocktail parties where the kids get to walk around and pass out hors d'oeuvres and drinks. I can remember at 10 carrying a tray of martinis into the living room. And then we'd all go to bed and the party would really start. But my family was dysfunctional in the sense that there was no affection ever showed. There was no love. I never remember my parents hugging, kissing, uh, I love you. It just didn't happen. And then, so as I became an adult and started getting involved with people, relationships were very odd to me. Relationships became an opportunity to find out what I could use you for, or what you needed to use me for, what I needed to give you so that you would want to be with me. Um, I was a person with very little self-esteem. 
And I was the kind of guy, especially in college, that uh, if you wanted to run off to Las Vegas, I was with you. We'd go. Didn't matter what my schedule said. If you wanted to go drinking, I'd go drinking. If you wanted to go to church, I'd go to church. You know, whatever it took for you to want me to be with you is what I did. And I went on like that for uh, quite a number of years for reasons that I still haven't figured out. I moved every four or five years. I guess that was because that's what my parents did when I was young. And it wasn't up until 1982 that I finally relocated to Southern Oregon. And uh, I met a woman in 1984, finally fell in love. I mean, I thought this was it. This was the, this was my soulmate. And uh, she was a couple of years younger than me. And um, we got a house together, and I had, you know, the visions. That was it. And then she walked in about three days later and said, you know, this just isn't going to work, so I'm going to move out. I was stunned. I was this, I couldn't believe that this could have possibly happened to me because I was the guy who didn't get married to their high school sweetheart at 17, didn't have the divorce at 25 with two kids. You know, I waited till I was 32 to meet the right woman, and it all fell apart. So I did what I thought was a smart move. I married her older sister. <laughs> now, her older sister and I got along great. She was my soulmate. She always agreed with me, never argued, did whatever I wanted, always had a smile on her face. She was wonderful. So we got married. And then I discovered that she was like that because she pretty much drank all the time. <laughs> and that was my introduction to the wonderful world of alcoholism. And we were married for about three months, and she was having several physical problems. So she went to her doctor, and her doctor told her, I'm not even going to start to treat you until you start to deal with your alcoholism. So she would go to the 9 o'clock morning meeting in Ashland, come home at 10, pop a beer, sit down at the table, and tell me about the meeting. And we did that little game for a couple of weeks. But then she finally realized she needed to do something about her alcoholism, and so she went into a recovery center. And what I didn't realize at the time was the night before she was supposed to go in, I went to bed, went to sleep. I got up in the morning, and she was still awake. Well, she was so afraid of going into that recovery center that she had gone through our house, and she had drunk anything that might even resemble alcohol. She had smoked anything that might even resemble something to smoke and taken everything that she thought might give her a buzz. So when we drove over to the recovery house in Medford, Oregon and opened the door, she couldn't get out of the car. She basically fell out of the car. And so we had to carry her into the recovery house. And the first thing the nurse said to me was, you know about al -Anon? And I was so mad at them because they wouldn't tell me how much this was going to cost me. And of course, that's important in moments like that. Um, I said, hell yes, I know about al -Anon. She said, good, because you need to start going to meetings. I didn't know anything about al -Anon, of course. Why would I? Um, it's kind of interesting about that money thing, because uh, that was the only thing on my mind. You know, I was of the generation, still am, the just say no generation. You know, I had quit smoking in the 1970s. Alcohol was like smoking. You just don't drink, and then you're well. That's pretty simple, huh? And so I was not of the mood to listen to this nurse talk at all about alcoholism as such. So my wife went into this center, and I was religious in my attendance at every family-related meeting that they had. I learned everything there was to know about alcohol, alcoholism. We'd go to the open Saturday night AA meeting at the hospital, and this went on for a month. And the, the one day when I got to go see my wife over there, she was busy doing somebody else's hair. She was too busy to spend time with me. And I can remember that month, I was taking care of her son. I was making sure that he got dressed every morning, had breakfast, got to school, had clean clothes, did all that stuff. I had taken over the checkbook, and I had, you know, I was pretty much in charge. And as miserable as I felt inside, having gotten married to someone who was an alcoholic, I never let it on because 
I was not about to let anybody think that I hadn't picked the perfect wife. So here I am with this big presentation to the outer world of Mr. Happy Guy, and inside I'm killing myself. So she comes home from the recovery center after a little over a month, and we get locked into their aftercare program, which was ran for over a year. And she came home, and they told her that she needed to go to AA, which was obviously it's the smart thing, and that I needed to go to Alano. So in Ashland at that time, there was a Friday night meeting where both AA and al met at the same church. So I went into my first al meeting scared to death. I didn't know whether I was more afraid of knowing somebody there or of not knowing anybody there. But I went anyway because I wanted to learn how to keep an alcoholic sober. <laughs> None of you can relate to that, I imagine. <laughs> And uh, I looked at the steps. A couple of them are related to me. I've been going to Allen on all these years. I still don't know how to keep an alcoholic sober. What happened that night to me, and it's one of those things I can never explain. Of course, the room was filled with women. And as I left that meeting, I knew that my life could either change or it wasn't going to change. If it was going to change, I had no idea how or why. But there was something about that meeting and the joy that those women shared with themselves and the welcome that they gave me that made me want to go back. And so I started going to Al-Anon. And I went and I sat. And I went and I sat. It never occurred to me that there was a program that I actually had to work. But I went and I sat. And I went mostly because I was taking my wife to the AA meeting next door, and that way I knew she got there. Well, we uh, we didn't last a year of sobriety, and we never could agree on who left who, actually. I think um, it was a situation where she never legitimized our marriage because she was drinking at the time we got married, and I think that was probably the real reason. So we could never have a commitment to each other as a marriage, uh, not in sobriety, and so after about a year, she moved out, and uh, I was still in that same house. And I was uh, cleaning the house and stuck behind the waterbed. Once again, there I go, talking about my life in the 70s and 80s. I had my waterbed. There were the notes of the fourth step that she had worked with her sponsor. And being nosy and wanting to learn what was going on, I read them. And I was amazed, I was awestruck by what they said, because I was wondering, who is she talking about? You know, what, what relationship is she talking about? Because what she wrote down had absolutely nothing to do with the marriage that I knew. So I was mad, of course. And I went out and I walked around and walked around, took the dog out, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there's two sides to every story. That had never occurred to me before, that she had her opinion and I had my opinion, and there really isn't any reason to think one is better than the other. It's just that she had her opinion. And it made me realize that not everything I think is true, not everything I believe is true. So it really opened up my eyes to the fact that there were more possibilities in life than what just went through my head. Now, I took a trip... Um, up to Alaska because I I found out in the troubles I had in relationships of always feeling like I needed to provide something to be accepted into any relationship or group, I ended up spending a lot of time by myself. And that was good because that way I didn't have to worry about other people. But when I went to Alaska that year, which would have been, I don't know, in the mid-80s or late 80s, I felt lonely for the first time, and it was because I didn't have anybody to share it with. I was there, and I was feeling lonely. On my trip back from Alaska, I stopped off in Seattle at the International, and that was an eye-opening experience for me also. I don't know if any of you got to go, but I went with an agenda. I knew what I was going to do from the moment I got to Seattle until I left, and the first thing I discovered was the happily married couple in program that I was going to stay with had in the time I was in Alaska gotten in a big fight 
broken up, were both out drinking, and had absolutely no interest in, the, in going to that international. But they let me stay there nonetheless. And I was always seemed to, that weekend was in the wrong, what I thought was the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, I planned to be at this meeting, but I couldn't get into that meeting, so I go to that meeting. And I wasn't at this kingdom for the big Saturday night blowout. I was downtown at the Little al blowout, which was 1,500 people. But as I look back, of course, that's where I needed to be, because that night I heard a speaker named Rick B., who's now our executive director. It's the first time I'd ever heard a male speaker in al -Anon. And what he talked about that night was his experiences going to Montreal to the International because he was from Cincinnati, and he showed up. It was like, here I am, make the miracles happen. And, of course, that's not the way it works. You have to put something into it to get something out of it. And I realized that I had to start taking this program more seriously, that I couldn't just show up and sit in Al-Anon meetings for you know, months on end and expect miracles to happen. So I stopped going to my meetings looking for a mate, and I started going to my meetings expecting to learn something, hoping to learn something. I got, uh, I got on my knees. I started praying to my higher power, and basically just admitting that I have a bad picker. I don't pick the right people to be involved with. And I needed to let go of that. I needed to turn that over to my higher power. Just let go and let God. I, need, I was willing to accept the idea that, it, that if it were God's will, I would be single and celibate for the rest of my life. But I was not going to continue in that pattern of relationships that I had been in for all those years of my adulthood. And so right after the, well, actually, I met a woman at the International who lived in Seattle, and she was in al -Anon. She was much younger than I was. But we started corresponding through the mail and over the phone, and it was a new experience for me, and I don't know if you can relate to this, but I was the kind of guy that, you know, you slept first and discovered who she was later, you know, and this was a woman that I had to meet before we ever got to get together sexually. Whole new experience for me. And we never did get together sexually, actually, but we kept this relationship up for well over a year. And Seattle to Ashland is probably 700 miles or so, so it's not run over for the weekend kind of thing. I think we probably saw each other three times in that, in that time period. But it was just a good experience for me to, to realize the value of getting to know somebody as a person, that lust was not the basic ingredient in a successful relationship. Then I met a woman from Bend. Well, Bend, Oregon is only 190 miles away, so that seemed like next door compared to Seattle. And we did the same thing, but I was able to go over there more often. Plus, we saw each other at Allen on events. And uh, we fell in love, and we got married. And that's been 17 years ago. And I am the most grateful man in the room because uh, this woman came into my life. I have to tell you that back in my early days in Al-Anon, I was looking at my life like I had this. This is all I could see. I prayed for the health of four people in my first days in Al-Anon. All four of them died, including my father. A woman in a meeting once said, well, don't pray for me, please. <laughs> um, but it was a rude awakening, and the old-timers in the group took me aside and said, what kind of a prayer are you praying? <laughs> well, God, I want this to happen, and I want it to happen now, and I'd just as soon have it already happen, if you don't mind. Um, and that, they explained to me that that wasn't really the way to pray in Al-Anon, and so I discovered the 11th step uh, prayer, but I also discovered there were 10 steps before that, and that I might start thinking about... Um, looking at all of them one at a time. And I was told that they're in order so that intellectuals like me don't get confused. And so I, that's what I did. I started working the steps seriously. Um, and then the craziest thing happened. I have a son from a woman who was a friend of mine for about 14 minutes. And um, I'm giving myself the benefit of the doubt there. <laughs> She might say it was three minutes. I don't know. But 
I, I've been told that uh, by AA people that uh, AA taught them how to not commit suicide, and Al-Anon taught them how not to commit homicide. And that was me. I mean, we would have never been able to survive in a relationship. And uh, she had our son, and uh, she lived in California, and I didn't see him very much, if at all. And then out of the clear blue, in 1991, she calls and says, it's about time you and Charlie got to know each other, so I'm driving him up, and he's going to spend the year with you. Oh. 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 Okay, he was in the sixth grade. Now, I had absolutely no experience with him. He was an only child, raised by his mother and aunt and grandmother. Uh, we had a wonderful year together, actually. I had a lot of growing to do. Thankfully, I had a very supportive al on uh, family in Ashland to help me. Um, and we had a good time. And I think that he probably would have liked to have stayed with me another year. But his mother realized almost immediately this was a major mistake because she didn't have him around. And so the day he, the last day of his school year in Ashland, he was told to come back to Sacramento. And that was it. Now what happened that spring, which was just so amazing to me, is that I had moved my father, who had Alzheimer's disease from California, up to Oregon to a hospital so that I could visit him. And uh, the day I took Charlie to meet his grandfather on a Friday, and on Saturday, my father died. Now, in that weekend, I went from father, I mean from son, who felt I was never a good son, to a father. You know, and, and Charlie got, to, it was like the three generations together for that very short amount of time, but that really changed my life. So... Charlie moved back to his uh, his mother's. I uh, proposed to uh, Michelle. I had it all planned out, drove Charlie back to Sacramento. We turned, went up to Lake Tahoe. It was in June, had the little cruise on the lake out to Emerald Bay. It was going to be beautiful, full moon, you know, the whole Marianne. It snowed. <laughs> we're on this boat. We're 20 feet from shore, and we can't see the shore. And they have all these people on this boat. Well, because of the snow, we all have to be inside, so it's crowded. We tried to dance, and somebody put their cigarettes out in our drinks before we came back to the table. So it wasn't quite what I had planned yet again. But after dinner, we had a quiet moment. I proposed, and she said, well, I don't know. Uh, I said, you know, this is kind of like a yes or no answer. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I have to think about it. And so it was a very long night, and it was an even longer drive home. She came back to Ashland, and she said that uh, we had breakfast that next morning, and I was washing the dishes. And she was sitting at the table thinking to herself, how stupid can I be? Here's a guy that's washing the dishes who, who wants to marry me. So she said, yes. And I said, guess what? And she said, well, I'll marry you. And I said, I already, I'm not asking. I said, you know, stupid me. I said, I, I'm not asking. I asked you two days ago. I'm not asking today. You have to ask me. <laughs> well, fortunately for me, she did. And we got married. Um, and she was in Al-Anon already. She was in service work already. And I was in service work. And, uh, for those of you that are new, whether it's in AA or Al-Anon, I would strongly suggest getting involved in service work. If for no other reason than it keeps you around the winners. You know, I don't, it's my feeling after all these years that looking out at all of you, you're all miracles. You know, I've been around the recovery centers enough to know how many alcoholics never find sobriety. And the number of friends that I know have, have known who died from alcoholism. So every one of you in your recovery is a miracle, and you should be very grateful for that and grateful for each other. The commitment that all of you have shown me this weekend, just in terms of your commitment to recovery and to each other and the friendship, it's just amazing to me. So I just want to applaud you all. My wife and I were involved in service work in Oregon. I, was, I ended up uh, eventually being the Oregon area treasurer, and she... Um, 
was the literature coordinator for the state, and it was really neat for three years to travel together and to participate. But after three years, we realized that it was time maybe to slow down a little bit, to uh, stay closer to home. And so she and I took on um, doing the Southern Oregon Literature Depot for our district in Southern Oregon, and we provide literature. And it, actually, I was telling some people earlier, tomorrow another couple is taking that over. So we have been doing that all these years. And the service work has been good for us. Uh, being a part of Al-Anon has been good for us. You know, I was, a, I was a kid that grew up in a home, as I talked about, that was dysfunctional. My, my father, who I uh, had a hard time with when he got sick at such an early age, was a man who was raised left-handed, and his mother tied his hand behind his back so that he would learn to do things right-handed. Because in those days, that's what they, they thought. You know, you could do every, that's how it worked. Well, obviously that's not how it worked. But he learned that you're, he taught me that you're dealt the hand you played. You know, you're, you're dealt the hand and that's the hand you play for life. And that's why when I was married to that alcoholic, I thought, well, this is it. I mean, this is the best that I can do. And I'm going to uh, just make the best of it. And that's why I, when I was praying, I was like this, because I couldn't appreciate the fact that once I let go to my higher power, my higher power had 360 degrees of viewing and had possibilities in my life that I had no way of knowing. You know, when I was praying for those people and back in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, I had no idea there was a woman in band that I was going to end up with. Um, just the possibilities of the miracles in this program are amazing. Um, I was just going to say something in it. I just had a senior moment, and it just took off. Oh, I think probably the most important part of this program for me and the, uh, the thing that I always focus on with um, people I sponsor is the spiritual side of the program. I fought that for a long time because I was raised in a traditional Christian church where you're hung by a thread of guilt over the pit of hell, all that nonsense. And I had a real hard time when I came to Al-Anon and they were talking about higher powers and da-da-da-da. And, and I heard people say, well, my higher power is my cat because he never talks back. And my higher power is the group and my higher power is the tree in the front yard. And, well, then I heard a, leave it to AA, I heard a wonderful AA speaker from Sacramento who was talking about the fact that in his years of sobriety, he would come home from his meetings just angry, and he couldn't understand why he could be so angry. So he went to an old-timer, and he said, what's going on? And the old-timer said, what I want you to do is write down the characteristics that you see in your higher power. So he did, and he took it back, and he showed the guy, and the guy said, well, no wonder You've created a God in your image who's critical, judgmental, all those things. Now go home and write a list that of the characteristics you want to see in your higher power. And that's what I did. You know, I decided it's my higher power. You know, nobody else has to accept it or you, know, you all have your own, so go for it. But what I did was I created a higher power in my image. So when I pray to my higher power, I feel like I'm wrapped in a warm blanket on a cold winter night by the fire. I'm safe, I'm secure, and I'm loved. And that's what worked for me. I don't have to think about that God of my childhood. I don't have to think about that God that I see in church. I can think about that warm, cuddly feeling that I have. And that's made all the difference for me. You know, I was the kid who grew up afraid of everything. I was afraid of theory, I was afraid of success, I was afraid of failure. I'm a big guy, I was afraid of looking awkward. You know, I wasn't going to learn how to ski because I might fall down. And because of my low self-esteem, I was what was referred to as a, not a human being, but a human doing. If you criticize something I did, you criticized me right to the core. And so, as I came into Al-Anon, Slowly but surely, by coming back and listening, I learned that it's okay to be human. It was okay for Gunther Baker to be human, to make mistakes, that I was going to be okay even if I didn't do it perfectly every time. 
And that was a good lesson for me, too, because I was I was just not that guy. Um, so I have become a human being. I have become a spiritual being who can have the faith to reach out to not only other people, but to my higher power. And I know today that nothing's going to happen to me today that my higher power and I together can't handle. But I have to look there first. Now, as I said at the beginning, I was not raised in an alcoholic home. But believe you me, I married into one. You know, my, my wife, you shake her family tree, you're going to get killed by Jack Daniels bottles. I would almost, you know, she was, she was raised by an alcoholic father. She raised two alcoholic boys. She married an alcoholic before me. You know, her, just, it goes on and on and on. And those two boys have interesting stories of their own because they're nearly 40 now. But an alcoholic is an alcoholic and the thinking doesn't change. They can stop drinking. But the thinking process sometimes. And they, uh, do they do what I think they should do? No. You know, I, I love going to conferences and I've heard a lot of AA speakers speak. A lot, a lot of recovery share. But I have never once heard an AA speaker come to the microphone and say, I've been sober for 25 years, but you know, I just can't stand AA meetings. I, they just don't do anything for me. You know, I've stayed sober, but it's not because of AA. So here are our boys. AA is not for them. Those men aren't smart enough for them. They don't understand their problems. And I just bite my lip, you know, over and over. I try and just let go and let God because they have to find their own way. And today, hopefully by the grace of God, they're both clean and sober. But it's not because of anything I did. It's certainly not anything that their mother did. It's because of something that they have to find themselves. And it's just a hard lesson because I was the kind of guy who always knew what was better for everyone else. I mean, I'm cursed with that. I know what's best for you. I don't have a clue about me, but I know about you. And when I was in high school, even people would come up to me with their problems and talk to me like I was supposed to know something. So it just felt on me naturally to be someone who was a sage. But you reach a point where people don't want your opinion anymore, you know, and they may not have wanted it in the first place. But I've learned in Al-Anon to bite my tongue. I love to be asked. I will more than happily share my opinions, of which I have many, but I don't offer them first. And when I uh, spent a short amount of time in San Francisco before I moved up to Oregon, and one of my favorite things to do was to go down to around the cable car section of Powell Street and Market Street because there were always tourists always trying to figure out how to get someplace. Well, I could tell them. I gave a lot of advice to tourists in San Francisco. But the one day that I was trying to explain to a bus driver the best way to get someplace, I realized I'd probably stepped over the line and it was time to uh, give up that process. And one other thing that I would like to add is that I said that my wife and I um, used to go to a, the Addictions Recovery Center in Medford in, on family night, and we would speak to the family and the patients. It was an inpatient, outpatient clinic. It still goes on. One night, I don't know how the conversation got to this point, but it got to the point where somebody said, you know, how can you keep an alcoholic from drinking? And I just said, well, you just the only way is to shoot the son of a bitch. <laughs> and, that was when my wife decided we'd probably done that uh, service work a little too long and and I needed to uh, back off a little bit. Um, I am still baffled by the disease. Um, I don't know why one person gets sober, another person doesn't. The program has given me lots of tools to use. Um, one that comes to mind is when I see an, uh, someone suffering now from the disease of alcoholism, I still feel the pain. I still feel the sympathy, but I no longer feel the guilt because I know there wasn't anything that I could do. I didn't cause it. I can't control it. I can't cure it. I'm powerless over what people, other people do, people, places, and things. Um, I try and focus on myself. We all know life happens. Um, all Al-Anon gives me 
are tools to try and make my life healthier on a daily basis. I like to think of myself, and of course I'm not, but I like to think of myself as a golfer. Now, I could, many of you can relate to this. I could go out and play the 18 holes with a putter. Any golfer knows it might take you all day, but you could play the whole 18 holes with a putter. But why, if you have a whole bag of clubs, would you just use the putter? Now, al has given me a whole bag of clubs to use in my life. If I choose not to use them, then that's on me. But they're there for me. All I have to do to choose them is to use them. And so much of my life, I didn't think I had choices. I was, I was dealt that hand when I married my alcoholic of choice. You know, that was it. No choices. But I've learned in Al-Anon that I do have choices. I can say no. I can say yes. Uh, I don't have to put up boundaries. I don't have to create walls. I'm never going to do this again. Every time an instance comes up, it's, it's unique. I need to look at every opportunity. I need to look at every stepping stone, every stumbling block, and then decide what's best for me to do. I don't have to. I just hate the term uh, the boundaries. You know, I don't know where that, ba- that came from, but I hear people in our meetings talking about boundaries, and I think, you know, you, that's, a, that's the wall of China. You know, I need to look at every situation individually, and I need to make a choice then as what's best for the situation. Sometimes I say yes. Sometimes I say no. But the, the fact that I have the power to make the choice is what's so important to me, you know, because I just never thought that I did. Now, I'm, I'm going to close. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful that all of you are here, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And God bless you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.